How's everybody this morning? Good? Are you guys ready to worship Jesus? Would you stand with us if you're able? Let me pray for us as we get started. Lord God, we come before you with um, expectation, Lord, of what your spirit is going to do this morning. God, we know that you are a God that um, when you are with us, we are filled. And when you are, your presence is in this room, that we don't leave this place empty. So Lord, we invite you into this time, invite you into this time of worship. God, may you be glorified. May you be blessed as we sing to you. You are so worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together.
Morning, everyone. <clears throat> hey, if you're new, welcome. If you're not, glad to see you also. Um, if you are new, we'd love to know that you came. My name is Brian. I get to be the pastor of this community. We get to be part of it. And we're so glad that you're here to worship with us. Um, for those, who, those of us who are part of Ignite City for a while, um, I don't know if you noticed my voice. I feel like I've hit puberty a second time. Like, it's just really, I'm starting to feel it. Man, this sinus infection that's going around, it is no joke. It just does not let go. And so if you've gone through it, man, I feel you. If you haven't, run. Just don't do that one. This is not a fun one. Uh, but we are glad that you're here. If you would let us know that you're here, you're looking for a church home, uh, we would love, it, we'd love for you to be here if this is where God's calling you. If not, like if afterwards you sit there and go, I'm not sure if this is where God's calling me, I would love to help you connect in a ch- with a church in the area that I believe teaches truth and shows love. Uh, For those of you who are part of Ignite, you've heard me say this, and I I fully believe this. I'm not interested in competing with other churches. Um, I'm not trying, we're not trying to be the biggest and the baddest in the area. We want to, we want to see every follower of Jesus part of a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, loving Jesus church. And so if you're looking for one, um, and maybe this isn't where, where you feel like the Lord's leading you, I would love to help you connect with a church in the area that I trust, that I could, that I could introduce you to them. Um, and so you can just use the Connect card or you can come, to me, come up to me afterwards. The Connect card, just go to ignitecity.church and you'll see it. Just click Connect card and just fill it out. But we want to help you plug in wherever that is. A few announcements for the morning. Uh, young adults uh, in the room, you've got a little game night coming up on April 19th at 6 p.m. at the Portessi's house. And so they w- we'd love to see you plug in and start to get to know other young adults. If you're wondering, am I, am I young enough? then the, I think there's your answer if you're trying to figure it out. I, I, am, I know that I'm not, but I would love to go do that, but I know that I'm not there. there. But young adults, we want to make sure that we are reaching your community as well as this. Young adults, I would love to hear from you. Zach would love to hear from you. Hey, what, what are you all thinking? What are your friends thinking? What are they needing? Uh, we want to make sure that we're reaching the next generation as well. And so please know that emails are always open. I would love to have your conversations with you just to kind of hear your thoughts on what we as a church can be doing for you. Um, I am convinced that the gospel really is the remedy for everyone. But we want to make sure that we are partnering with you in reaching your, next, in reaching your generation. Uh, Youth Sunday, for those of you who are students, um, I know it's usually the fourth Sunday of every month, but it's going to be, Youth Sunday is going to be this next one coming up, not today, but next week. And so we would love to see her be here at 930 um, I love watching you guys greet everyone as we get here. There's just this army of young adults yelling at us and cheering for us. As we, I was like, I feel like a pretty good guy now as I walk up. And I remembered hearing, and I don't think they're here, that unfortunately, a little guy named Jackson. As I walk up with somebody, he looks at me and goes, fresh meat. And I was like, I don't know. I'm really hoping no one else heard that. But hey, welcome. I'm so glad. But then they start cheering. And then I remember I told you I got booed by a couple. And that's okay. I booed them back. In fact, I booed them throughout the week. I sent the, the, the sisters texts with just the, a little gif or jif or whatever you call it that said boo. And so I, as a pastor, I really have a spiritual gift of encouragement. And I wanted to make sure that they knew that they were cared for and loved. Uh, but make sure, make sure that you know you Sunday is not two weeks from now, but it's next week. So be here at 930. Help us set up and, and then be here for the morning. Uh, prime timers, you have a luncheon coming up on the 28th. Starts at 12, goes till 2. You can register for it online. Got some music playing played, got comedy. Um, no, I am not the comedian. I don't know if you think that, but I'm not that guy. Um, but we'd love to see you be part of that. And we have a couple things that we want to celebrate with people. I got this email late, later last night. Um, Lacey Carr ran a half marathon, and I thought, why? Man, give her props for that. And I thought, I was really encouraged. I thought, man, I want, okay, so not this year, not next year, but never will I do that. So just so you know, that is not a desire, but congratulations, and you're here. Well done. And then we want to congratulate David and Amber. Uh, they got engaged. And so here's a little picture. We want to say congratulations on your engagement. Is Amber here? I wanted to see if. David, did you, do a, did you do a good job proposing? You must have, because she said yes, so well done. That's good, I'm glad. <laughs> well, congratulations to you both. Hey, we're going to go into a time where we, uh, we take our offering, for those of you who are part of Ignite City, you know how we do this. 
Um, for those of you who aren't, please feel no pressure. We don't pass a, a plate. Um, there's a place to give in the back. You can give online. But if you're a guest, please feel no pressure to give. Uh, we're just glad that you're here. If right now is a tough time financially, I know that for a lot of people it's tough. Don't ever feel pressure. We just trust the Lord that he's going to continue to provide for our community. So this is not a twist your arm to convince you to give. This is just as the Lord leads, great. And if you just you can't do it right now, please Please know it's fine. And if you're struggling, please let us know. As a church leadership, we would love to know how we can come alongside you during this time to practically help you um, as, as a lot of people are facing some financial t- um, times that are difficult. So uh, during this time of offering, feel no, no pressure, no guilt from us. Um, and we're also going to go to a time of prayer. Um, just as a reminder, whenever there's a time or there's a prayer request that you'd like to share, there's always a prayer book right there at the Connect Center. You can just share it. Um, and we'll pray for it right here as a community. You can also email in your prayer request. You can go to the website. Uh, there's a place, a form to fill out prayer requests. We have a prayer team that is dedicated to praying for you. And so please share anything that's coming up and praises. I mean, we want to hear how it is that God answers prayer uh, because we believe that he does. And so, man, share praises with us as well. Um, but we're going to go back into a time of singing together, singing to the Lord. Um, so let's come together and let's pray. Let's pray together, shall we? <clears throat> Father, we thank you for another morning to come together as your people to give praise to Jesus. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence with us and in us. We thank you for your faithfulness to us. We thank you for how you provide for us. We thank you for how you teach us and care for us. God, we thank you for mountaintop experiences and valleys that you walk through with us. All of them teach us things. All of of those things grow us more and more into the likeness of Jesus. Father, as we take this time and we present offerings to you, God, would you use it in great ways? Would you give those of us who have responsibility over it to be wise, to be discerning? God, that we would seek you and your will. God, would you show us how we can impact lives? God, would you show us how we can use it for the advancement of your gospel? Would you show us how it is that we can meet physical needs of those who are in need of help? Would you show us how we can use it to impact people around us, not just this community, but around us? God, we want to see you do great things, and we thank you that you've entrusted us with your provision. God, you've been so good, and I'm so grateful for it. Father, we want to pray for John, who's recovering from heart and kidney problems, that he would hear the gospel and respond to the love of Jesus. God, we thank you that he's come through those surgeries, those procedures. We thank you that you've shown grace and mercy. But God, we pray that that would lead him to an openness of your gospel, that he would come to surrender his life to Jesus, that he would experience the difference of the gospel, that he would experience the indwelling of your spirit as he surrenders to Christ. Father, we pray also for Rochelle, who's struggling physically right now, and I pray your healing touch over her, God. I pray everything, God, that you would just bless her with your comfort. By your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would cross her paths with those who are helping her, with people that love Jesus. I pray for physical healing, God. God, I'm so thankful to be part of this community. I'm so thankful that you've brought each of us together. And I thank you for who you still have in mind to bring and to become part of Ignite City Church. We thank you, God, that you called us to be part of your mission. We thank you for your care and your concern over us. We thank you for the way that you practically love us every day. And God, forgive me for how often I don't recognize it. I don't notice all the things that you do on a daily basis. Holy Spirit, would you make us attentive to what it is that you do on a regular basis? That there'd be nothing that we overlook, but that we would be moved, God, every day when we see the fingerprints of God over all of our lives. Father, as we continue to worship you, Jesus, we thank you that you made a way that we could come before the Father. Jesus, we thank you that because of you, we have re- we've been restored in relationship with God for those of us who have called Jesus Lord. Holy Spirit, we thank you for your presence among us and in us. We thank you for how you indwell your people. 
Holy Spirit, would you help us to worship Jesus in a manner worthy of Jesus? We can't do this without you. Father, for those who are just in a difficult time, I pray, I pray that they would see your full, you, being, you being faithful and that you are the God of all comfort and that you comfort all of us in our times when we're downcast. God, for those who are in need of whatever, God, I pray that you'd remind them of how you provide for everyone, but you also teach us in these times of want to need. And so, God, I pray that for those who are just in that time when they're wondering what's going to happen next and how do I move on from here, Father, I thank you that there is a greater lesson that you are still teaching and there is greater intimacy with, that, with you that you desire for us. And that so often is introduced to us by the storms that we face and the times where we wonder where you are. We thank you that you take us deeper still. God, I pray that you would help us to come honestly before you, that we would celebrate, that we would confess, that we would repent. We thank you for your desire for us. We thank you, God. And so, God, as we continue to sing to you and as we continue our morning together, God, to you be all the praise, all the glory and all the honor for you alone are worthy. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone who agrees says, amen, amen. What gift of grace Jesus, my Redeemer, there is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold.
this morning. Would your Holy Spirit draw us close to you? God, convict us. We know that you have already prepared the way this morning for your spirit to move. And so, God, we just, we want to be open, have open hearts, open minds, open ears to your leading this morning. We love you. We give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go ahead and take a seat. <clears throat> All right. Hey, before we get into the, the passage for this morning out of Matthew 7, just want to read a little, uh, read, read a passage from Genesis 12, 1. Um, it says this, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I got to be honest, I don't know that I would like that commandment because he doesn't say exactly where he's going. He says, I want you to go, I want you to leave country, leave everything you know, and I'll show you where I want you to go. There's a song that I found, a singer by the name of Rita Singer. What a great name to be a singer. Isn't that fantastic? Rita Singer is like Brian Preacher. That'd be weird. <laughs> anyway, this is, he shared a song, If You Say Go. And hear the words, if you say go, we will go. If you say wait, we will wait. If you say step out on the water and they say it can't be done, we'll fix our eyes on you and we will come. Your ways are higher than our ways and the plans that you have laid are good and true. If you call us to the fire, you will not withdraw your hand. We'll gaze into the flames and look for you. Friends, I've said this over and over. These words that I want, that I want you to be and go where God wants you, no matter what. It used to be just try to convince everyone to stay, because I just love y'all. And so those who are glad to stay, I try to remind them, hey, that state closed. They don't want Californians there. They don't want us to come. They're not interested. But then it's always a joke. And I'll even tell them, hey, Tennessee closed. Trust me, they're, they're full. They don't want anybody else. But no one has ever believed me. But we pray them out because we believe that God entrusts them to us for a specific amount of time, that they impact the, our communities with us for this time, and then we send them out. And so this morning, I need to announce that that's what's happening again. Uh, I've known this couple for almost, well, let's see, if you, if you average them, about 12 years. And I have loved doing ministry with them and getting to walk through life with them. And it's, uh, it's painful, but I know that they have sought the Lord, and the Lord has put this on their heart, that this is what they're to do. And so when they told me a week and a half ago, it was a shocker, but um, I, a lot of times I'll joke my way through things, um, but God and I have had good chats, and I know that I'm in a season of trust, but I also reached out to the church that Chris and Haley are going to be going up to in Salinas, and I, and I spoke, I, I, I emailed them. And I just ripped him apart. No, I'm just joking. I didn't. He didn't do anything. I wanted to make sure that he understood, hey, God bless you. Because what, what God has made clear to them and how God has opened doors for them um, to be part of that community, what I said was this, you, have, you are getting to work with the best worship leader that I have ever worked with. And so I'm going to ask if Chris and Haley would come up, and we're going to pray them out. Their last Sunday with us will be on May 19th. Um, they're going to head up. They didn't want to bring it to my attention until after Easter, which I was kind of thankful for. But um, the, God has called them to be part of that, up, that area up there. We're going to trust the Lord with our future as well. I'm not worried about that part, but we do want to make sure that we honor them for their service uh, to us and the way they've cared for us, um, but also excited for what it is that God's going to do through them in a new community. They both told me that for the, it's been the last couple years, there's just been this stirring in their heart. And then they found out that this church has been looking for a worship pastor for the last two years. And that's a long time. And so you just kind of see how God brings it together. And so I wanted to make sure that we brought it to you guys as soon as I hear, heard about it. Um, as we begin the transition and, and sending them out well, like we've done with everyone else who's left our community to go wherever God calls them to be. Again, this is not competition with churches. I just don't like that mentality. Um, but we want to send them out well because of how well they've served and what an honor it's been. And so I'm going to ask if you guys would go right there on the logo. 
Uh, we are going to do a couple things on May 5th. We're going to do something. We're going to do something as a community all together. Um, so be prepared. We'll get more information to you about that. But then on the 19th of May, is that will be the last Sunday. And so it's going to be pretty much so worship heavy. So just be prepared because your voice is going to go out and you're not going to be able to lead when you get up there because we're going to use you to the last second. Uh, but to the, both of you, uh, in front of everyone, I'm going to tell you I love you both. And it'll be hard to say. It'll be hard to see you go, but I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful, and I'm so proud that you will get to impact another community as much as you've impacted ours. But then personally, um, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the way you've allowed me to pour into your life. And so, Ignite City, if you could do me a favor, could we all stand and could we come along and lay hands on them and pray them out? Okay, let's pray. Father, it has blown my mind the way that you have worked through this couple for so many years, individually before they came together and were married, and now, God, how you raised them up for such a time as this, the way that our community has been blessed and taught and ushered into a, a worshiping community because of their faithfulness. I thank you that you have provided. I thank you that you have shown and been faithful in showing them this is definitely your plan. I thank you that they sought you so much and so long. And so, God, we entrust them to you again. We thank you for the impact that they'll have on this new community. We thank you for how they will be ushered into deeper worship to Jesus. We thank you for our brother and our sister and their little boy, Leo, and we pray your blessing on them. Oh, Jesus, I pray that they would experience the intimacy with you they've never experienced before, that you would take them ever deeper in relationship and intimacy with you. We pray for every provision to be met as they make the move. God, we pray for the perfect place to live. We pray for a community within the church that they can say, this is my family. And we pray for greater impact, kingdom impact that will leave disciples amazed and blown away with the glory of Jesus. God, we thank you. We pray this. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone who agrees says, amen, amen, amen. Would you let them know that we love them? Uh, All right. Well, that's a heck of a transition. So why don't we jump into the Word? Um, we are in Matthew chapter 7. We'll be starting uh, in verse, uh, verse 7, but it's going to be a little while before we get there. And again, we're looking at the topic of prayer and persistence in prayer. Friends, I used to think persistence in prayer means this. You just keep bugging God until he changes his mind. Like, just keep bugging him. Like if you can count, like if you can pin them on the ground and do that thing that siblings do to one another. Does anybody have an older brother or older sister? Okay, younger siblings. We are the ones that are victims of our older siblings. Just so you know, I know the other older siblings are like, you don't know how hard it is, Tyler. Stop it. But it's like you don't need, you don't understand. No, we do understand. I remember, and I think I, if I've shared this before, I don't remember who I tell this to. I remember my brother at one point. He pinned me down. There were about three and a half years difference, and he pinned me down. He got my arms like underneath his legs, and he was over the top of me. And so he would do this kind of thing to me, just kind of like, ha, ah, ha, my parents aren't there. And we were both taking karate, but I couldn't get out of this one. There was another time I nailed him in the ribs, but that wasn't this time. Then there was this one other time where I'm like screaming, and he was, just pretend like you're all youth. You'll like this story. He's, he's holding spit, thank you, like over me, and then sucking it back in. You know what I'm saying? 
Like it would, it would hang out, then he'd suck it back in. And so I'm just like, get off me, no, no. And then one time, like not one time, but on that same occasion, gravity won. <laughs> but my mouth was open. <laughs> and so for those of the older siblings, you don't understand. You don't get it. But I, know, but I used to think you just pin God down and you just keep poking him in the forehead until he changes his mind to what it is that you want him to do. That's like we've turned persistence into prayer, into pestering prayer. And I wonder if we've kind of missed what it is that we're supposed to do with it. I mean, we look at verses. It says, John 15, verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Mark eleven twenty four. therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, it will be yours. Matthew 21, 21 to 22 and Jesus answered them, truly I say to you, if you, have, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. I mean, when you read verses like that, doesn't it sound like, well, we must be doing something wrong. I mean, if you ask it, it's yours. You have enough faith. It's yours. It's yours. Guys, you know, how many, you know how many preachers who aren't really about Jesus, the prosperity gospel preaching people, they will use verses like this and they'll put people into bondage saying, well, if you have enough faith, like see, I mean, honestly, if you're struggling financially, then give to our ministry because when you give to our ministry, have enough faith that God will bless you tenfold. And then what happens when all of a sudden it doesn't happen? And you have that person who uses Jesus' name in vain. And guys, I know that's a bold statement, but what else does that mean in Exodus chapter 20 when God says, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain? In other words, don't attribute my name to your personal agenda. But to say something like this, you need, if you have enough faith, he'll give you everything. I mean, you have so much if you just believe I cannot tell you guys the stories upon stories. If we just sat, we just, even if you looked up online, how many people's lives have just been torn apart and shredded apart because they listened to someone who said that, and that person who said it received all this monetary stuff while the person continued to struggle, and they didn't see, they didn't see the fruition of it. If you just do this, you will become wealthy. If you do these things, have enough faith. You will be healthy. Every single time you pray for someone, they'll be healed. I gotta be honest, friends. I have prayed for a lot of people, and they've still died. It didn't change. I prayed that their lifestyle choices would change, and they kept going into it. And so is there something wrong with my faith? I mean, he says, if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell Mount Baldy to just jump up Un uproot yourself and go to the Pacific and drown yourself. You should be able to tell the mountains to move. And so then when it doesn't happen, here's the first thing that we do. We sit and go, I guess I don't even have faith the size of a mustard seed. But I'm wondering if we've taken the, the, the word of God out of context. Guys, I'm convinced that we're supposed to use the Bible as the greatest commentary for the Bible we're supposed to look at what do all the passages of Scripture talk about when it comes to faith. In Hebrews chapter 11, starting in verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. When you jump down to verse 6 in the same chapter, it says, And with, without faith it is impossible to please him. Guys, that's a strong, bold statement. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. There's nothing, I mean, if I don't have faith, I could do all the nicest and coolest things, but if I don't have faith to say, you cannot please God without faith. He says this, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. So in other words, we should, be, we should let faith move us instead of us trying to move faith. I think I brought this example up many times in the last few weeks, but it, I, personally for me, I want, 
I mean, I'm 49, so 50 is the next one coming up here in June. So 50, and however many years God has for me, I want to learn what it means to wait on the Lord. How often have I sat in a meeting with a bunch of pastors and someone comes with a great idea, it's like, I had this idea in the shower. You ever notice how many great ideas come to you in the shower? I don't know why that is. It seems like it's a godly time. But it's like, I was just in the shower. There was steam. I pretended like it was the presence of God, like the cloud descended on our tent of meeting. I'm butt naked before him. I'm just being raw and honest because I can't be anything else. And I just have this idea. It just comes in my mind. I'm telling all the pastors, and this is how we pray. So pray about it, and this is what it is. God, if you don't want us to do this, let us know. That's all we pray. Well, he didn't say no. Let's do it. But my question is this. Did he actually say yes? Was it actually from him or did I just get creative? How much of my ministry career has been me just coming up with ideas and then in the middle of it just asking God, hey, I know this got a little mess here, so will you please clean up my mess? I tried to live by faith. But what if I lived this way? What if I said, I'm not moving until I know that you've told me to move. I'm not going until I know that you're leading me. I won't make this decision until I know that you have made it clear that you want me to do this. What would it look like then? What would it look like to wait patiently upon the Lord, believing and trusting that he actually knows what he's doing, has a plan in everything, and possibly there is greater things that happen in the time of waiting than in the time when we see God provide? What if I changed? And I've been praying that, I mean, recently. Even the last week and a half, I've been praying, God, teach me to wait. Teach me to trust and I told you all back that I am in this, season of, in this season of trust that a few months ago was just on my heart and I had this thought pop in my head. Just be prepared for the season of trust. And I thought, oh, that can't be good because it's never comfortable. When God teaches us to trust, it doesn't feel good. Friends, the only way I learned to trust God is that I have to be put into situations where I have to trust God. For those of you who are in it right now, and you might be wondering, okay, where is he? I don't see it yet. How long? How long? I can't answer the how long part. But I promise you this. Even if you feel like you're in the fourth watch of the night, the last watch of the night, that is when Jesus decides to walk all over your storm. But there is something that he's teaching you along the way until he gets to that moment. And so all I ask you to do this, just hang in there and wait. Wait and hope. And isn't it amazing that in the Old Testament, the word hope and wait in, in the Hebrew is interchangeable. That if I look up the definition for the word hope, there is the concept of wait. If I look up the one for wait, there's this, there's this concept of hope. And God promises he blesses those who learn to wait upon the Lord. And those of us who trust in the Lord... In the last few months, I've gotten some medical things I've had to deal with. I finally found out why I had to have stints put in my heart a year ago because I have these lipoproteins that are just huge, I mean, massively high. But that won't ever change. No matter, it's, it's just, it's just part, of my, part of my genes. And so I just have to eat super well, but trust the Lord. And it's, I mean, when I first heard about this about six or seven weeks ago, man, it hit me and was sitting there going, wait a minute, so it could happen again? Like, and now I'm at a higher risk of a heart attack or stroke. Like, really? Like, this is it, God? And then my wife reminded me when God knit you together, he knew what he was doing. That there's this attitude of trust. There's this heart of trust. I can come before God and say, nothing's changed. But isn't it hard when you first get the news? When, the first, when that thing first happens? Then God's been good and faithful through it all. And then I see blood in my urine. I'm like, what the heck is this? I've never had that. That's a new color. Praise the Lord, I had CT scan done and all it shows is a couple kidney stones and I'm like, I've had those before. They suck. That's all that it is, but it's this. They say, worry, right? It's like, what is it? But what, if it? but what if it's this? And what if it's this? And you ever notice you can put your mind in these places that just leave you almost feeling like you're losing everything when you stay in the land of what if? Instead of running to God who is. So when he says a season of trust, 
When big decisions have to be made and God moves you out of the area, God is still saying, trust me. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. And all these things, friends, there is something that God is doing and waiting is necessary for us to become more and more like Jesus. So friends, we continue. We continue to look to what does the Bible say and we believe him. I make the decision, I make the choice, just like I said at Easter. Instead of saying, hey, don't freak out, don't be anxious, like don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Okay, I'm not gonna worry about it. Instead of doing that, hey, don't worry about it, just believe. Make the choice to believe. I'm gonna believe God. And we are able to believe him more when we actually believe who he really is. We know him. We look at the pages of scripture and it says, this is what God is like. I don't have to freak out, why? Because God's omnipotent. I don't know what to do, but God knows. He's eternal, he's lived out all of my tomorrows. I don't have to freak out about the future because he owns it. We don't, we don't try to change everything by our own ideas. We wanna be moved by God. And so that's why I'm saying, I wanna learn to wait on the Lord. Just to wait, God, whatever you want. But make it clear that this is what you want instead of me just guessing. And then you can come up and clean my mess. Look at how Jesus started in prayer in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. He said, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Starting with who he is. You are Father, Abba. You are Papa, Daddy. But you're also holy. I worship you and I come before you in both ways. And then he says, your kingdom come. In other words, God's a king. But it's your kingdom, it's not mine. I don't want anything about me to go forward. But how much of my prayer life is spent trying to tell God, hey, bring your kingdom down into my life and wrap your kingdom around my life. Instead of me saying, hey God, whatever you say in your word, I will do, why? Because you're king and I want your kingdom to come. And here it is, your will be done. Do we pray that? And when we do, do we mean that? No matter what. Whether it's times of plenty or want, we get extra or we get less. God, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Isn't it amazing that that's how Jesus taught his disciples to pray when he said, start this way. It's about him. It's not about us. I wrote this in my notes, prayer is not our attempt to make God line up with our wills, but rather an opportunity to bring our wills in line with God. It's not God, change what you're going to do because of me, this is my desire. No, 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 it's God, make me in line with you. What? How do we know what to ask for? That's the beauty of it. We can just ask and we trust that God's gonna answer the way that he wants to. We don't stop and we're gonna, we'll get more into that. But what if first and foremost, God's sitting there going, I need for you to have your heart in line with mine. If the scriptures say, delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. It is not this foolproof way that you can win the lottery. He say, delight yourself in me, I'll give you new desires. You will begin to want the things that God wants. But how does that happen? You abide. You spend time with him. You get alone with him in the word. You get alone with him in prayer. We abide with him. Friends, if we aren't doing that, we cannot expect that our desires will come after the things of God. It, it, it happens when our hearts are in line with him, and that happens when we are intimate with him in fellowship. And so as I said, let the Bible be the best commentary for the Bible. Listen to what Jesus says in John 14, starting verse 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified to the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. That phrase, in my name, is mentioned twice in two verses Go down to chapter 15, verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit, and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So there it is again. Just say whatever you want and then just tag it at the end. In Jesus' name. Boom. And the, the bank vaults will open and the money truck will explode outside your house and cash will just be there. And then perfect health will come. And it's like, there it is. There, just in Jesus' name. And don't get me wrong, friends, when I pray, and I always close it in Jesus' name or in your name. 
Well, what are we saying when we say that? Friends, it's not a magic formula to get whatever we wanted. What we are declaring in that moment is, according to your character, according to your will, according to your desires, in the name of Jesus, would you do this? And if it's not according to your will and according to your desires, then your kingdom come, your will be done. But what we're saying is, I am, I am an ambassador for Christ, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And because I'm an ambassador for Christ, I'm supposed to speak on his behalf and not dictate what it is that he should do, but I should speak on his behalf and be, be about the work that he's about because I'm his ambassador, as are all of you who are followers of Jesus. We don't say in your name to kind of convince him that he really should do this. We say in your name because we say in your your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. First John chapter 5, 14 to 15, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything, and here's the phrase, according to his will. That's the same thing as in Jesus' name. He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So here's the thing, friends. We can be confident that God will fulfill his will 100% of the time. And when we pray according to the will of God, he will answer it 100% of the time. Again, but how do I know what it is? Get alone with him. Be alone with him. And then, as I get alone with him, I begin to know his heart, know his heart better. And then I get with other followers of Jesus and ask them, hey, this is what I feel like God might be doing. And I get their counsel and their advice, and I speak into them as well. And then I keep waiting and I keep praying, and God is working in me, and God is working in you to what? To convey his will to us, his heart for us. So we will begin to pray the will of God and not just hope that his will fits in with mine. An example is this. Because when we say according to his will, there are times where God will say absolutely yes. And then there will also be times where God says absolutely no. But I don't think he sits and goes, don't you ever ask again. It's like at least he's asking, but I would never answer that request. But what's it look like when he says yes? Well, in 1 Kings chapter 18, for those of you who've been brought up in the church, you might know this story about Elijah and the 450 prophets of Baal. For those that don't, just picture this. It's like this, uh, this competition kicks in. There's King Ahab. He's evil. He's married to a wife, Jezebel, who's even worse than he is. Elijah prayed, don't let it rain, and it didn't rain for about three and a half years. God answered it. It was part of the will of God. And so then all of a sudden, Elijah shows up, and there's Ahab, and Ahab looks at him and says, There's you are. there you are, you troublemaker. He's like, I'm not the guy that's making the problem. That's you. So he's like, hey, how about we do this? What if, what if you get all your prophets and I'll meet you on Mount Carmel and we're going to have this competition. We're going to set up these altars, but you, once we're done, we're just going to pray. You don't get to do anything, just pray. And whichever God answers, that's the God. That's the true God. So they, they, he agreed to it. Down in verse 21, it says, and Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Friends, for those of you in the room, that maybe you find yourself kind of landing on, well, I like Jesus, but I like this as well. Like, I know Jesus says this, but I don't agree with that part, and I want to live like this, even though the scriptures point against it. Or I know people who struggle with or have these thoughts or feelings or ideas, but I really wanna, I wanna back their play, but I'm gonna do it in the name of grace. Friends, when we start to tell people that they can live against the things that God makes clear in his scriptures, we are not showing them grace, we're actually leading them away from God's grace. Jesus is the epitome of grace and truth. For us to not live in both, for us to live in one side or the other, is to not live according to how Jesus is. Friends, do you realize that the Bible speaks against greed? It's a sin. Even if I don't act on it, it's a sinful thought or idea or feeling. Do you realize that God speaks about adultery? That the only place for a sexual relationship is in the covenant relationship between a man and a woman in marriage, period. 
That if you're not married and you're engaging in that, God's suddenly going, this is not anything that I bless. This is sin. Marriage is defined by Jesus. One man, one woman. Do you realize that in the beginning, God created man. In the beginning, he created him. Male and female, God created them. That God set up an order in the beginning of creation. This is what he has set up. That followers of Jesus, and I know that people will sit there and go, you're homophobic or you're xenophobic or whatever phobic you want to throw on us. But friends, we're holding to this. Why? Because we actually believe that what God says brings about life. We believe it. This isn't us standing against people. It's us, man, my heart's breaking for people that don't know Jesus, but I can't condone sin. And as followers of Jesus, we can't condone it in the church. That in the church, we're called to repent daily, confess and repent from sin. Why? Because we love Jesus. And we can't claim that we love Jesus if we're disobeying his commandments. Guys, God sets it up. And I think he's asking us the same question. I think he's asking the church in our day the same question. He's saying, how long are you going to stand on these two differing opinions that you have to make a choice? Either God is God or he's not. If he is, give him everything. Submit to him completely. If he's not, then don't follow him. Friends, do we have that much confidence in God that God will show up? That God will make it clear? Are you that convinced in your relationship with God? Like you love Jesus and you know that God is real and you know that God is right and faithful and righteous and pure and holy and loving and gracious. You believe this book. Like are you convinced of it? I'm praying Friends, that none of us need one more YouTube video to make sure we really now believe it. I don't need another celebrity that comes out and says that they love Jesus to make me really believe that Jesus is real. Why? Because it's me and him. And then it's the church and we're coming together and we're living out this life, but I don't need someone who's made prominence. They've achieved prominence in order for them to make me feel like my faith is now genuine. Guys, it's not necessary. How long will you fight between two differing opinions? So there they are. One guy, Elijah, 450 prophets of Baal. They set up two offerings. The God who answers, that's the God to be worshiped. You look at verse 25 of 1 Kings chapter 18. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull, Prepare it first, for you are many, and call upon the name of your God and put put no fire to it. And they took the bowl that was given them, and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. And look at the response. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. Can I ask you a question? Is this how you feel when you pray? You're doing all this stuff. You're saying all the words. Does it feel like God just got quiet? Just got silent in the moment? Or has it felt like it's been too silent for too long? Then Elijah starts to trash talk. Oh, Elijah and I would get along. Listen to the things that he starts to say at noon. And Elijah mocked them saying, cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself. Are you kidding me? I know that maybe, maybe you have a translation. Somebody here has a translation open says, or maybe he's busy. Actually, the better translation for that word is, maybe he's going to the bathroom. Guys, that has got to be one of the rudest things. Can you imagine to me just walking into another place of worship that has nothing to do with Jesus? They're, wash, they're worshiping their little God. And I walk in going, what, you don't see him answering? Maybe he's... Maybe he's He's taking a poo. Like, you just got to go, go loud. Get louder because you got to interrupt the moment. So here's Elijah just mocking them. Or he is on a journey. Or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. And then they break into their customary way of praying. They cried aloud and cut themselves 
after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. At what point do you think that may be Elijah went, I think I took this a little too far. As now blood is pouring out of their body and they're crying out to God. It's like, this is how much we mean it. We're going to cut our bodies. Blood is just pouring out. And look at the response. They raved on until the time, the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. We can easily look at that passage and go, yeah, but look, they're not even praying to a real God, which they weren't. But again, my fear is how many of you, this is your experience in prayer. Like you're going through all the most, you're even getting excited and standing and running around and kneeling and doing all this stuff, but there's no answer. No one speaks. It doesn't feel like God's paying attention. And you've prayed and prayed and prayed for something to change. Please, God, please, 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 please. And you just keep going because you think you can just do this so that he'll what? He'll cave in. But what if we stopped and said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What if we start there? A submission to him, a submission to his lordship, a trust in his care and his concern for us as a father of heaven. And so Elijah rebuilds the altar of the Lord. Nothing happened for them. He sets up the offering. And then Elijah prays for about 13 seconds. Not hours, seconds. The only reason I know that is because I remember reading this a while back and I actually timed myself. That's how anal my time is, or I just don't have a life. So I just timed myself to see how long this would take. Listen, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are a God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. There's three key parts to his prayer. The first is this. You are God in Israel. In other words, I know you are to be God. I know who you are. That's what we start with. It's like us saying, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. He's saying, you are God in Israel. There is no other God. So we start with who God is. The second, he says, I'm your servant. In other words, we know our place. Friends, I don't know a lot of kings and servants where the servants get to just tell the king what to do. I know my place before the king. I'm to submit to his lordship. I'm, su- I'm supposed to submit to his sovereign reign. But it's this third part. I have done all these things at your word. I remember when this was revealed to me. I was, I was listening to somebody else preach. I was like, what? I've never seen that part. I have done all these things at your word. What, what are all these things? Who do you think came up with the competition? Who do you think came up with the idea? Hey, build an altar. Put everything there, but just let fire from heaven come. Was it Elijah? He's like, I'm just going to try something. Or is it possible that God is the one who came up with it, gave it to Elijah, saying, this is what you're going to do, and this is how I'm going to fulfill it. And Elijah's saying, you're God, I'm your servant, and I have done everything today at your word, at your command. Your will be done. Do you see it? Friends, this was according to the plan, the character, and the will of God. How do we know this? We know the plan, the will, and the character of God when we abide in Jesus. We begin to know it more. And we constantly pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. But isn't that a great story? Like, that's the part where God says yes. But what about when God says no? What if you ask and he says no? Parents, have you always given everything to your kids every time it's a yes? They come up and say, can I have? And you're like, yes, yes. Can I go play in the street? Yes. No, I mean, if you grow up in a, if you grow up in a neighborhood where you can, I mean, I grew up in a neighborhood where we could ride our bikes all through the street because there wasn't really any cars. And if they were, you just said car, and you just bolt out of the way. Hopefully you don't get hit. It's like, hey, can I, can I play with this? And it's like a razor blade. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You gotta learn. You would never do that. Why? Because we love our kids. And so why is it when God says no, we think that we've either done something wrong or that he doesn't care, rather than going to God who is 
our Heavenly Father and realizing and remembering just the way that I say no to my kids at times because what they're asking is not good for them or it's too small and I want to give them something greater. Just like I would do that. Why can't we go before God and hear his no and realize he's saying no? Why? Because he loves us. And he'll say no, this isn't for your good. This isn't what it is that I want for you. I know that in the moment this seems great, but you're gonna have to trust me. I'm saying no to this because I have something better in store for you. And until we get there, like we talked about the waiting, until we get there, so much more will change in you before you get there that you'll be prepared for what it is that I wanna give you because I've done the work in you while you've waited. It's amazing how we think that God's gonna just do everything immediate. Guys, when you read the book of Mark, you know his favorite word as Mark is listening to Peter as he's preaching and writing out his gospel inspired by the Holy Spirit immediately. I mean, it's used, it's, it's used in places that it shouldn't even be used grammatically. It's immediately, immediately, immediately. And we sit there and go, God works immediately all the time. Guys, when you, I think we talked about this passage where I brought it up a couple weeks ago when, when Jesus heals the woman with the flow of blood. Guys, she struggled. He's like, immediately she felt in her body that she would heal. And he felt power leave his body. But we forget about the part where it says that she struggled with it for 12 years. But there was something that God was doing in those 12 years that at that moment, on that last year, that last day of those 12 years, when she gets to come before the creator of the universe, incarnate, and experience the healing touch of Jesus, to experience what it's like to be healed by God, there is no point in that passage where she finally looked at Jesus and goes, finally, I've been praying forever. When she was healed, she came before Jesus because he kept asking, who touched my clothes? Who touched me? And he wouldn't leave until she came up and confessed it. Came before him in fear and trembling. And he says, daughter. Why is that so important? Because for 12 years, she hasn't felt like that. In 12 years, she has felt like God's against her. People tried to avoid her, to be away from her, because if they touched her while she had this problem, they were considered unclean. Can you imagine every single person trying to get away from you, never being around you? Everyone's thinking, you must have sin in your life because this problem is going on. And in that moment, in front of every single person, Jesus calls her daughter. Friends, she wasn't going to die that day if Jesus didn't heal her. But Jesus knew that what she needed most was not to be physically healed, but she needed to feel valued. And in that moment, the creator of the universe spoke one word into her life that I'm convinced made her realize I'm adored. I'm loved, I'm liked. He called me daughter. Guys, in the waiting, God is doing something to prepare us for when God works immediately. Does that make sense? In the waiting, God is preparing us for when he works immediately. Do we trust him with the no as well as with, with the yes? So now we're finally at our passage for the morning. That was the intro. In Matthew chapter 7, 7 to 11, listen to this. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Friends, the way that it's worded in the original language, it's more like what Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep seeking and you will find, keep knocking. The verb's there, it's not just one and done, be done. It's like, no, 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 keep asking. Keep seeking, keep on knocking, and the door will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Do you hear the promises that God gives there? Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. And everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. In other words, I don't even have to open the door. I don't have to kick the door down. I just have to have the nerve to walk up to the door and knock and keep knocking. He says, or which one of you, if his, verse 9, or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? Does anybody sit there and go, where'd you come up with that? Like a kid walks up, can I have some bread? It's like, here's a rock, shut up. Can I get some fish? Oh, here's a snake. 
Guys, I guarantee that every single person would have understood what Jesus was saying there. Guys, in that area where Jesus was teaching, there would be these rocks that looked like they had the resemblance of these little loaves of bread. So you can imagine Jesus picking one of those up and going, if you ask your dad to give you bread, do you think he's going to give you one of these? Even though it looks like it, it's not what you need. He knows that. He said, what do you get? where do you get like fish and serpent? Well, the word serpent might be better looking at it as fish or eel. And I know for some, he's like, it's my favorite thing when I get sushi. Yeah, but not when it's slithering around. You don't just jump and go and just grab it with your mouth. And if you do, you need help. But it's like, it just doesn't make any sense. So it's like, okay, you ask for a fish and then he just gives you this thing that looks like a serpent. It's like kind of close, but not quite. It's like he's saying this. You know how to give good gifts. That's what he says. If you then, verse 11, if you then who are evil, oh, that's not, that's not encouraging. Can you imagine if Jesus walks in, he's like, we're saying, what do you want us to know about? Tell us, tell us, teach us. He goes, oh, I love you guys, but you are so evil. Oh, praise, praise Jesus. That's big. My heart's just feeling it right now. Thank you. Guys, when we can accept the fact that we are evil to the core because of our sin and rebellion against God, it's then that we can actually live in the grace of God and realize that God's grace is truly amazing. I don't have to impress him with anything. I know I'm evil to the core. Outside of Jesus, there's nothing that I can present before God that is holy or right or true or pure. The only reason I can come before him is because of Jesus. He asks the question, he says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your, to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We think this. God, this is what I want. I'll even say, please, will you give it? And when God says no, it's because what we look at is not a real loaf of bread or a real fish, it's like a rock or a serpent. And God says, no, I'm not giving you that. And we can sit and go, but I know this is, this is it. This is what I should have. And God's like, you don't know. When he says no, God is not less loving. God is always pure love. He is always good. He is always right and righteous. In his yes and in his no, he is always a good father. So what do we do? We just keep asking. Because why? He's not offended by it, friends. He's not offended by it. And we keep seeking and we keep knocking until he says no. Until he says no, you keep going. But once he says no, what do we do? In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7, Paul says this, he says, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Guys, I gotta be honest, that does not sound like the most life-giving thing that God could give anyone. It's like, what is, what is, the, what is the best thing God has given you this year? He gave me a messenger of Satan. I love it. Oh, it's so great. The thing is, we don't even know what it is. I know some people say, oh, it's a physical thing, and it might have been. But what I'm thankful for is that the scriptures don't really tell us what it is. Why? Because what if God blesses, blesses us with a quote-unquote messenger of Satan to keep us from becoming conceited that looks nothing like what Paul had? What if God's sitting there going, I want you to understand that what it is that you're going through and facing, what you have to face and deal with You've asked, and I haven't taken it away. Why? Because of a greater work. I, I want to use this thing that I haven't taken away to keep you from becoming conceited. He's doing a great work. Verse 8. Three times I pleaded. Haven't you asked and asked and pleaded over and over, and God didn't change his mind? The word pleaded means to ask for earnestly, to beg. Like you're begging God. Would you please, would you please? I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me in verse nine, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect. In other words, it's a polite way of Jesus saying no. 
Would you please, God, would you please, would you please take this? Or would you please provide it? Would you please give? And hear Jesus say, no, no, my grace is sufficient. My power is made perfect in weakness. And what's Paul's response? Therefore, I just kept pestering. I pinned him down and I just thumped him on the forehead until he finally gave in. He says, no, therefore I will boast. The word boast means to brag about, to rejoice in, to glory in. I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses. Guys, that word weakness, it's a word for illness or infirmities. About a couple months ago when I got that news and the medical things I've had to deal with, and some, praise the Lord, I've had some good reports, but it's just that one that lingers around over and over. It's like, why can't that change? Why can't that change? And I could sit there and just go, come on, God, come on, God, come on, God. Or I could sit and go, I'm gonna learn how to boast in this. I'm gonna learn how to rejoice in this. I'm gonna learn, God, you gotta teach me how to do this. Why? I'm gonna learn to boast and be excited and to celebrate in the infirmity that I go through. Why? So that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ then, the fact that Jesus said no, I am content. Guys, well, if I say the word content, doesn't it just all of a sudden you sit and go, oh. isn't that a sense of peace? Like if I could really learn to be content. Guys, that word content means to be pleased with, to enjoy, to take pleasure in, to prefer, to choose something as better. So here's what Paul is saying. He says, I am content. I prefer weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. I'm not there yet. How about you? I'm learning, and I want to be there, and I praise God that he'll be patient with me through the process. Robert read showed or shared this uh, quote from Elizabeth Elliot, which I then looked up and then I, I found the book that it came from and I read the whole thing. It's amazing. I mean, I've known of her for years and I've never read her stuff. And now I want to devour every book. It blew my mind. But this is the statement that he quoted and this is the statement that I said or that, that, that blessed me. He said, I am willing. This is her. Remember, she lost her first husband on the mission field because the people that he went to serve killed him. And then she lost her second husband years later to cancer. You realize even after the first husband died, she still went back to the same people who killed him and ministered to them and brought them the gospel. I mean, she's powerful. She says, I'm willing to receive what you send, to lack what you withhold, to relinquish what you take, to suffer what you inflict, to do what you command, to be what you require, and let my obedience be without interruption. In other words, God, your kingdom come. Your will be done. Whatever. And if it's in less or weakness, as I will learn to boast and prefer weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and the like. But when I do ask for something, you say, yes, this is according to my will. I want to give this to you. And I'm going to celebrate See, I'm going to celebrate whether God says yes or no because both of those answers are always connected to the goodness of God and God being a great father that I will learn to boast. It's not natural to boast in weaknesses. I will learn. I will choose to boast in those things. So according to Matthew 7, we're called to keep asking and keep seeking and keep knocking Friends, for those of you who are going to keep knocks, like I'm not going to like, I'm not going to leave here until God gives me this. Now, if that's where he wants you to go and you just sense the Lord leading you, just keep praying. I just want to see how much you mean it. Go for it. Just make sure you're knocking on a door and not a wall. And I think a lot of times you think, I'm just, God can do the impossible. Yeah, of course he can. But friends, I think a lot, of, well, I think most of the time, if not all the time, God puts the walls in the way to direct us to the doors he wants us to knock on, not kick our way through the wall. You knock on the door, but what if he doesn't open that one? You move to the next. You keep asking. You keep knocking. You keep, you keep seeking. You just keep going. 
Why would I have the nerve to do that? Because I know he's a good father. And just like I don't want my boys to ever worry about, hey, ask dad. No, don't ask him because you've asked him for too much. Just keep asking and I'll keep saying no. I'll say yes to, but I'll keep saying, I'll, I'll say yes to, you know why? Because I love them, because this is, hey, come to me, I'll do whatever I can. But I'm gonna make a decision that I think is best for you. And I'm evil, but our Heavenly Father is good, and there's never a decision that he makes that is not good and pure and perfect and right. So we persist in prayer. But we persist in prayer as humble servants before our king and grateful kids before our father. We keep asking, friends, and I want to challenge you, create a culture in your home and in your own personal walk with the Lord. Create the culture of persistent prayer. Create the culture of asking and seeking and knocking and realize that at no point has God ever gotten irritated because you've done so. You've simply done what Jesus invited us to do. That's persistence. That's persistence. Persistence with an ability to trust, to humbly trust that God knows best. Until God says no, friends, you keep praying. Until God makes it clear, you keep praying. Someone's sick, you keep praying. You know someone doesn't know the Lord or they walked away from the Lord, you keep praying. You don't stop, you just keep praying. Create the culture. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. As the worship team comes back up, just to finish up reading verse 11 again of Matthew chapter seven, he says, if, if you then who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? I want to remind you, you ask, and God gives good things. Even weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and the likes, God gives good things only we need, we need to be changed so we see things from his perspective, that we can receive his gift, whether it's something that's wrapped in what's comfortable or not, whether it comes from a yes or a place of no. We persist in prayer because we've been invited to, but we humbly submit to whatever it is that God desires to do because we believe that even though we are evil and we can give good things, God always gives good things. Can I pray for us? Let me pray. God, teach us how to persist in prayer. Would you teach us how to rejoice in weaknesses and hardships, persecutions, and the like? God, would you teach us how to rejoice in when you say yes? and to rejoice when you say no? Would you teach us how to prefer your will? Would you teach us how to pray wholeheartedly believing your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? But God, thank you for the invitation you give us to keep asking, to keep seeking, and to keep knocking. And we thank you, God, that you will direct, you will guide, you will, you will provide God, in all things, we want to submit ourselves once again to you. You are the king of our lives. We are your servants. You are our father, and we are your kids. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everyone who agrees says amen. Love you more than you know. Let's stand and sing together.
Father, we thank you that your love is greater still. We thank you. Thank you for the reminder, God, that you know exactly what we need. And you give it exactly when you want. For what's best for us according to your will. And now, God, I pray that you would anoint us, Holy Spirit, to go out. Every day this week, God, show us who is the one that you want us to impact with the gospel. Every day, who's the one? They would see people come to know Christ, that needs would be met, but ultimately the people would be come, that they would come to know Jesus. God, please send us out. Prepare us. God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone who agrees says, amen. Love y'all more than you know, friends. We'll see you next week.